All right, I'm Joey Davila. I am your presenter today, and I'm what's standing between you and lunch. So why don't we get started? All right, first thing right now, memes never die. Sometimes they fade away, but <laughs> they never die, and they're always good for a comeback. The funny thing about this meme is that you can't unsee it. So if you've seen the poster for the upcoming Avengers movie, uh, yeah, you start seeing that, uh, you, you start seeing the boyfriend with the wandering eyes everywhere. Uh, and after working on an AR presentation uh, long enough, you also see AR everywhere. So um, for those of you who were told, yes, you do need Xcode 9.3, that is true. But for this particular tutorial, we can get away with Xcode 9.2. So do not worry if you were not able to download Xcode 9.3. Demo 2 will need a tiny bit of modification, but it will work with Xcode 9.2. So you are in luck today. Uh, I'm going to very, very quickly cover the secret unknown history of AR. And the first mention of anything like AR goes all the way back to L. Frank Baum, the guy who wrote The Wizard of Oz. And he wrote another story that not too many people know about. It's called The Master Key, an electrical fairy tale. At one point, the protagonist meets the devil, and the devil gives him a pair of electrical glasses. And if you wore those glasses, it would display letters hanging over the heads of people indicating their personality types. G for good, E for evil, W for wise, F for foolish, and that kind of thing. So um, there is a 100-year-old literary precedent for AR. 1968, Ivan Sutherland uh, invented the first AR rig. You can see it on the right there. They nicknamed it the Sword of Damocles because it hung over your head. And it was huge, and it would kill you if it fell on top of you. And uh, he's considered the father of computer graphics. A lot of his students went on to do great things, including Alan Kay, who would then make Smalltalk the basis for just about every object-oriented programming language we use today. Uh, Henri Gouraud, who made the shading method that bears his name. And a guy named Ed Catmull, who would end up doing some really important stuff at Pixar. The term augmented reality was coined by this guy, Tom Caudell. He worked at Boeing, and he came up with a system, you can see it on the right side of the screen, an AR system that allowed line workers on Boeing's factory lines to lay the literally miles of wires that went inside a Boeing jet. It was a lot, uh, it it was a lot more sophisticated than uh, the old method, which involved using lots of spray paint and wooden blocks. So yeah, it's, it's him we have to credit for the term AR and augmented reality. Now, if you lived in Toronto, uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, and you always thought Google Glasses looked dorky. You ain't seen nothing yet. University of Toronto professor Steve Mann, who liked to call himself a cyborg, would spend the 1980s wandering the streets of Toronto with a PC basically taped to his back and this AR rig. And he, uh, he and his students uh, built a following, so you would see gangs of guys that looked like this wearing huge, uh, AR rigs that were cap- uh, that, that you could develop using the technology of the time. And uh, yeah, that's one of his newer AR rigs right there. Uh, Steve also has the dubious distinction of being the first person to be beaten up for wearing an AR rig. He wore it into a McDonald's in Paris, and the, uh, I know, McDonald's Paris, but anyways, the employees at that particular McDonald's did not take very kindly to what they saw was being recorded, and a fight ensued. And then finally, this is AR, believe it or not. Uh, Does anyone recognize what this is? Anybody here watch football? This is the the system. It's the first and 10 system. And uh, by the way, once in your life, you are al- once in your life, you are allowed to use this transition, after which you are no longer allowed to use this transition anymore. I've decided to use Ray Wend- uh, RW DEFCON as the place to use it. It's this one. Okay, I'm no longer allowed to use it. This is also AR. If you ever watch British soccer, or as they call it, football, uh, you have probably seen AR ads where people in the stadium 
see one ad on the stadium walls, but people watching it on TV will see different ads, mostly localized to where they're viewing it from. So let's get a little more specific now and talk about AR Kit in a nutshell. Really, it's just three things. It is real-world images taken from the camera, plus virtual images which you are generating, plus sensor smarts, because it's not just enough to overlay images over the real world. You want to, you want to use the device's sensors in order to sense things about the real world so that the virtual images you're drawing over the real images actually have something to do with each other. Now, as far as the user requirements go, you're going to need uh, your users, and of course, you, if you're developing it, are going to need an iDevice with an A9 processor or better. That is, in other words, uh, on the iPhone, iPhone 6S or better, all the way up to the current model, the iPhone 10. Uh, any of the iPad Pros and any of the 2017 or 2018 iPads. You're also going to need iOS 11, and particularly the uh, newly released iOS 11, 11.3, uh, I believe, that came out with uh, Xcode 9.3. You will, of course, need the user to grant permission to use the camera, because without camera images, AR Kit doesn't work. And finally, adequate light. So AR kit is not going to work in a pitch black room. And then as far as your requirements go as AR kit developers, you will need, of course, the user requirements, plus Xcode 9.3 or later. Remember, in this case, for this demo, you can get away with Xcode 9.2. If you're running it and you're running into trouble, I will walk you through it. A basic understanding of scene kit and sprite kit. Not too much. I will give you just enough scene kit to be dangerous. Here's one that you're not going to see in a lot of other demos. You are going to actually walk around with your eye device because this is AR and you're going to have to interact with the real world. And the other thing is uh, some of the, uh, the things you have to do to make use of the app will require you to walk around and make use of your device. It'll be fun. I am sorry, there's going to be a tiny bit of math. Uh, there's no getting away from it. We are dealing with 3D spaces in the real world. I will try and keep the math as painless as possible into a minimum. And then finally, the willingness to deal with constant upgrades. Uh, these are the early days of augmented reality. And of course, um, of course the uh, smartphone OS manufacturers are locked in a life and death struggle of making sure that you buy their stuff and not the competition. So, expect a lot of upgrades. Uh, in the six months that uh, we've had, six or so months that we've had AR kit, of course, we've already had a leap from 1.0 to 1.5, and there have been some incredible capabilities added. So let's talk really quickly about what real world things AR kit can identify. I'll go through really quickly, and then later on, as we go along, you're going to see these in action. It can detect real world horizontal planes, and we can do stuff with it. It can, as of ARKit 1.5, detect vertical planes, and uh, we can do something with those too. 2D images, we won't be covering those, but if you look in the book under the workshop, there is a project where uh, I show you how to detect 2D images. And then if you get the upcoming uh, ARKit by Tutorials book, there, uh, you can, you'll be able to write an app that takes advantage of face detection and facial feature tracking that is built into ARKit. And then, uh, really quickly, we're going to be working mostly with SceneKit AR. That is the 3D graphics uh, library. But ARKit is, can also use SpriteKit for overlaying virtual images over real ones. Uh, there is an article on raywenderlich.com where uh, it's the alien, the alien game uh, that uses SpriteKit. But for, most, for the most part, we're going to be using SceneKit. So any, uh, how many here have used SceneKit? OK, some of you. Not too many. Uh, more people tend to use SpriteKit than SceneKit. Uh, so think of this also not just as an AR kit tutorial, but a quick SceneKit tutorial as well. I will give you SceneKit basics in demo one. And then we're going to do two demos. The first one is Happy AR Painter, which is, has anybody here seen Google Pixel Brush? Someone wears the goggles, and then they have these two uh, wands that they can wave around and paint objects in 3D. It's a very expensive rig. With Happy AR Painter, I'm going to let you do pretty much the same thing with just your iPhone or iPad. And then we're going to pay tribute to our favorite Swedish semi-disposable furniture store by building our own version of IKEA Place, and I call it Reikia.
And it will not, and it will do a little bit more than IKEA Place does. IKEA Place only will let you place furniture, virtual IKEA furniture in the room. Reikia will also do that, but Reikia will also detect vertical surfaces and put happy posters of Ray's face on the walls, wherever it's detected. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Vicky, don't you like that? <laughs> Anyways. So let's get started with Happy AR Painter. I'm going to walk you through the principles behind Demo 1, and then we will start coding. Uh, if you like, uh, go into your folders and uh, go, uh, go look at uh, this tutorials folder and just fire up. You can fire up Xcode for uh, Demo 1. It's in the starter folder. So does everybody know who this guy is? Once upon a time in a magical land called Florida, there was an angry army sergeant who yelled at people and one day decided he didn't want to yell at people anymore, and he started a painting show. And this is that man. And we're going to pay tribute to him. So really quickly, what we're going to do is we're going to use SceneKit to draw virtual objects, and, you, uh, and that is going, those virtual objects will be our paint brush strokes of the program. SceneKit, if you've ever used SpriteKit Sprite Kit before, uses a tree structure of nodes, each of which represents something in a 3D scene. So there is the root node, which you can, can consider a stage on which you can add objects to, uh, just like you can add actors and props to a stage. Anything you add to the root node, of course, is a child node. So the gumdrop monster, the cat, and Yoda are child nodes of the root node and child nodes themselves can have other child nodes. So you can see the gumdrop monster is, uh, has a bag of money and a phone, and Yoda has a lightsaber. So those objects are the child nodes of those child nodes. The other thing you can do with SceneKit, which makes it really powerful, is that you can attach actions to nodes. And actions, uh, and actions can uh, perform animations and move, move nodes around. So what we can do is we can add an action to, say, Yoda's lightsaber. And when we tell the node to actually run that action, uh, you'll see on the animation here, Yoda will twirl his lightsaber. So we will be using actions as well to animate some of the objects we draw on screen. Here's where the math comes in, 3D math. You guys comfortable with X and Y, anyways? All right. Well. In 3D, we're dealing with X, Y, and Z. So X is left and right, Y is up and down, Z is forward and backward, where positive Z is towards you, and negative Z is away. You're probably already comfortable with the concept of the origin. Uh, in UI Kit, of course, the origin is upper left-hand corner of the screen. If you've ever done graphics in anything based on OpenGL, like, say, Sprite Kit, uh, the origin is the lower left-hand corner of the screen. Now, in ARKit, we have to pick an origin, and the origin is the position of the phone when ARKit starts up. And then anything else is basically distance from that origin point as determined by uh, some vis uh, as determined by um, the gyroscopes and, of course, the, cam uh, the camera, because ARKit also uses the camera to sense where you are in the room. And position, basically, is the position or the location of the device relative to the origin. And orientation is the angle at which the device is relative to the coordinate system. Anybody here heard of uh, terms like three degrees of freedom and six degrees of freedom? All right, yeah, some of you. So three degrees of freedom is basically just the angles. Those of you who are into airplanes or maybe pilots yourself are familiar with pitch, roll, and yaw, rotation around the x, y, and z axes. These become a factor when dealing with 3D things like ARKit. But there's also movement along the x axis, movement along the y axis, and movement along the z axis. And they are sway, heave, and surge. Uh, I, never learned the, I never learned these terms until I started doing ARKit, but apparently that's what those motions are called. Uh, we are going to be writing apps that use six degrees of freedom because we are concerned not only with where the device is, but which way it's pointing. 
And then finally, there is, of course, what X, Y, and Z mean in terms of the real world. So there are a couple of ways you can al align uh, AR kit. We're going to be using, uh, we're going to be using the gravity-based ones. There are two of them. There's gravity and gravity and heading. With gravity alignment, the y-axis is aligned with gravity. So up really means away from the Earth, and down means towards the Earth. X and, the x and y-axis are relative right and left to the phone based on which way the phone was facing when AR kit started up. For a lot of games, that should be more than enough. If you're writing, uh, if you're writing a naviga if you're writing an AR kit navigation-based app, you probably want to take advantage of gravity and heading instead. Gravity and heading use the use the internal compass of your eye device to go. Okay, all right. Yes, Y is going to be parallel to gravity, but X and Y, uh, at the X axis will be uh, aligned with east-west, and the Z axis will be aligned with north-south, where negative Z is towards the north and positive z's towards the south. Very useful, once again, if you are concerned about directions in the real world. There is one more alignment. We're not using it in these demos, but I want you to be aware it exists. It's called camera alignment. And camera alignment is totally based on the position and orientation of the phone when AR kit, start, when AR kit starts up. X is to the relative right of the phone, Based on its orientation, same deal with Y, same deal with Z. Probably useful for games where you expect people just to sit on the couch. All right, the last bit of painful 3D math. There is such a thing called a transformation matrix. There is a thing called matrix math. It, makes, uh, it is a construct that makes it easy to calculate what happens when you distort or make changes to an object in 3D space. There is a thing called the scene view, and that is basically a scene kit view that is connected to AR kit. And inside it, there is a property called the transformation matrix. We make use of it. It is a 4 by 4 grid of numbers. We only need a tiny bit of it. And the idea is that from this 4 by 4 grid of numbers, what we can derive from it is the camera's position and location in space. And we will just be extracting these two numbers, which, uh, these two sets of numbers, which tell us which way the camera is facing and where the camera is. We need this because we're going to use this to determine where to draw shapes as the user paints 3D shapes in the room. Uh, we also have to talk a little bit about computer graphics. There is such a thing as diffuse and specular reflection. I'm going to simplify it greatly and say diffuse gives an object its color and texture. That, in other words, that's when light, bounces, uh, light from various angles bounces off an object. And there's a thing called specular reflection, which is the shininess of an object. That's what happens when light bounces off an object in the same direction. And the best way to understand the difference or how diffuse and specular reflection play together is this graph, where going upwards, you're getting more diffuse reflection, and you can see more of its color. And as you go rightwards, you see, uh, you see more specular reflection, and you see the object is more shiny. And with that, we can finally get to the code, shall we? Let's have some fun. OK. So. Uh, I've got my project on the screen. I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to show you the main storyboard really quickly, just to know that what. Uh, just so you know what we're dealing with here. This is a two-tab. It's a two-tab app with a custom tab bar controller. We are mostly going to be concerned with the view controller of this upper, t uh, the first tab right here. The view controller for this is called Canvas View Controller dot Swift. I am, br I am going to break a whole bunch of architecture rules because I have stuck everything in the view controller largely for the convenience of the demo. There is another view down here. It is the brush settings view. Uh, it is controlled by the palette view controller. I have coded all of this for you. What this lets the user do is pick the, uh, pick the kind of object we will use as a 3D brush 
and the color and a few other properties. It doesn't really have that much to do with AR kit, but I wanted you to walk away with a fun app that you'll play with over lunch. So we've coded up that bit for you already. We're going to do all our work in Canvas View Controller Swift, so let's go there. All right. The first thing we need to do is set up a uh, set up a, set up a variable that will contain the configuration for AR kit. So if you scroll down to the properties, I'm going to do that right now. You should find a comment that says uh, mark define AR configuration. All right. And right there, what we're going to do is we're going to create a configuration variable. So follow along with me. I'm going to go let configuration equal AR world tracking configuration. So we're going to create an instance of that. And basically, what we're, telling, what we're specifying right now is a six degrees of freedom configuration. In other words, we are go we're going to have AR kit track both which way the user is tilting the phone and where in the world the user is taking the phone to. With that, we're going to go to our favorite method, view did load. And we're going to set up the AR scene kit view as seen under the comment called AR scene kit view. We're going to be setting the properties of an object called canvas. And what canvas is, is it's the AR scene kit view. It is a scene kit view that is also tied to the camera. And it is, it is the stage for which all our AR activities will take place. So let's start with, we're going to set its delegate property because we're, uh, we're going to be calling, uh, its delegate methods will be called. So we're going to set the delegate to this particular, uh, this particular class. So type in canvas delegate equals self. And we want to set up a couple of debug options. Uh, has anybody here used IKEA Place, the app, the virtual furniture one? Uh, you may have noticed at the beginning when you fire it up, there are little yellow dots that appear. Those things are called feature points. Uh, they indicate points of interest that ARKit has identified that it is going to use as landmarks to determine where, where the device is in the room and where you are based on the motion of those points. So we will turn those on. They are very convenient. And sometimes they're a good cue to the user that, yes, ARKit is working, and you're going to have to move your phone around for the device to get a sense of it. The other thing we're going to activate is a handy little tool that shows us where the origin is. So in other words, where the phone believes it, it is in the room when, when ARKit first started. And it will also show us the directions of the x, y, and z axes. Very handy debugging tools. You're less likely to use that debugging tool in a finished user app. So we're going to set up those uh, debug options by going Canvas, Debug Options. Uh, use the power of Xcode's I, uh, type ahead to help you with this. And we are looking for values of type AR SCN debug options. And we're going to say Show World Origin. and show feature points. And they're all contained inside an array. The other thing we'll, ask, uh, we'll, we'll have the canvas do is show us some statistics. These will appear in the little bar near the bottom of the screen. And it'll show us things like uh, how many polygons are being rendered, frames per second, that kind of thing. Uh, we're not going to rely, uh, we're not going to rely very heavily on them. Canvas.show statistics equals true, I mean. We're not going to rely heavily on them, but I want you to have it there so that when you're experimenting, you'll know what's going on. We're also going to set a property called Auto Enables Default Lighting, which basically adds lighting to a scene so that our virtual objects are a little bit easier to see. It's a nice little effect, and it'll also help us show uh, what specular highlights look like. And with these properties all set, we are finally going to do something that should be familiar to a bunch of you who've been doing iOS programming, and that is taking a session and running it. So we are going to, this is where the AR kit session starts, and we are going to pass AR kit the configuration we created. In other words, we are saying, okay, AR kit, run, and I want you to sense the world with six degrees of freedom. 
At this point, you should have an app that can run. Oops. So make sure you've uh, set your team to whatever your developer account is. Pick out your device and let's run it. Look at all of you. And as you can see near the bottom of the screen, there is, uh, there, there's, the, uh, there's the stats. If you select the brush settings tab, I've artistically set, I artistically set a, couple of, uh, a couple of selectors, and you can change the brush size, and we'll, we'll take advantage of these soon. So you've just written the Hello World version of AR, uh, for ARKit. Now what we're going to do is it's time to start. Uh, your, let's add your very first virtual object to a scene. So go back to canvasviewcontroller.swift and scroll down to the method called draw test shapes. And there you're going to see something that says draw a happy little orange sphere. So let's do that. We're going to create a, const a let constant called sphere. So type in let sphere. And it's going to be a scene kit node, so it is an instance of something called SEN node. Not SEN bode, but SEN node, which is short for scene kit node. And then pick the constructor that accepts a geometry object. And we're going to give that, uh, we're, and that geometry object is going to be an instance of SCN sphere, a scene kit sphere. And from there, it takes a bunch of constructors. The one we want is the one uh, that accepts a radius. So it'll be the radius of that sphere. And we're, deal we're living in metric land, so I am going to ask for a radius of 0 0.05 meters. That is 5 centimeters, or um, two, about 2 inches in the old-timey system. And with that, we have created a sphere. Now, it's now we need to give it a place in the world. So we will set its position property. And of course, this, is a, uh, this position is going to have x, y, and z values because it is in 3D space. And SceneKit expects 3D coordinates to be given in the form of SCN vector 3, basically a vector or a collection of three, uh, three digits. And I'm going to say, we're going to put it near the origin. We're going to put it at 0, 0, minus 0 0.3. Can anybody guess why I set the Z, uh, the Z position at minus 0 0.3 instead of just plain old 0? Yes, I heard that. Somebody said, so you can see it. And that's right. I got frustrated the first time I was doing experiments with ARKit, because I would draw something at 0, 0, 0. And then I'd fire up the app, and then I'd get all annoyed that I couldn't see a thing. And then it dawned on me, the origin is exactly where the phone is when ARKit starts up. And I would have to take a step back to see the thing. And I would go, ah, oh, that's it. So in my demos, I actually draw any object just a little bit farther back so that the user can see it. And nobody thinks, oh, geez, this app is broken. Delete. I want to avoid that. And you want to avoid that, too. Now we need to give the sphere a color, and here's where we go through a chain of properties. Thank you, SceneKit. This is where computers sometimes get annoying. The properties are, first of all, sphere.geometry.firstmaterial.diffuse, because we're dealing with diffuse reflection, and then finally, contents. This is the property you have to set <laughs> to give a SceneKit object a color. Uh, if you use them, um, and for now, we're going to give it uh, a UI color of orange. If you use that magical feature where you can option click keywords, if you click contents, notice that contents accepts any, and one of the any's is a UI color. Later on, we're going to change that any to a UI image in uh, demo two. All right, finally, once we fully define the object, we can actually add it to the scene. So we're going to go can we're going to access the canvas, in other words, the AR scene kit view, access its scene. And in that scene, we need to get its root node. Remember earlier I said the root node is kind of like a stage, and we want to add an actor to it, so we need to add a child node, and that particular child node is the sphere we created. 
At which point, we're good to go run the app, and let's go see that happy orange sphere. Oh, and let me type in sphere properly. I didn't call it. So okay, let's go back to let's go really quickly. Let's go back to view did load, and at the very end of view did load, after canvas.session.run configuration, yeah, draw test shapes, and let's try it again. And this time I see the sphere. And as I walk around, this is where um, the six-foot lightning cable comes in really handy. This will be your best friend if you are doing AR. Uh, if you are doing AR kit development, yeah, I know you can also uh, connect via Wi-Fi, but in a hotel Wi-Fi situation, that doesn't work. And Murphy's Law will just bite you sometimes. And sometimes, sometimes you need to take the Flintstones, Jetsons approach, and a low-tech com combined with high-tech approach is the way to go. With that in mind, let's expand draw test shapes a little further. So. We're going to add a, ha a shiny, happy blue box at a jaunty angle to, uh, to our scene. So I'm going to define a constant called box. And once again, it is an SCN node. So let box equals SCN node. Once again, we're going to use the constructor that expects a geometry. But this time, the geometry is going to be an SCN box. And we are going to use the constru SEN box constructor that lets us specify all the box's dimensions. And in this case, we're going to go with a 0.1 meter, 10 centimeter, about 4 inches box. So set the width to 0.1, the height to 0.1, the length to 0.1. And we don't want rounded corners on this one. So the chamfer radius set that to 0. So there's our box node. Next thing to do is we need to set this box's position in space. I'm going to move it slightly higher than where the sphere is. We'll also draw the sphere. So box position equals, we're dealing with the three space coordinates, so it's an SCN vector 3. And this time we'll say 0, 0 0.3, so about a foot higher, and 20 centimeters, or about 3-ish inches back. So minus 0 0.2 for the Z coordinate box position. I'm going to be kind and translate radians into degrees. But really, if you're doing computer graphics, you should learn to love radians. Uh, 45 degrees is pi over 8. So I'm, I'm, uh, this is a convenience constant that I'm uh, defining here. And based on that, what we're going to do is we're going to set the box's Euler angles. I know it's spelled Euler, but it's pronounced Euler. They're named after Leonard Euler, super mathematician. He, uh, we, don't have re we don't have 21st century math without Euler. And uh, it's, uh, the Euler angles is basically a collection of three angles, rotation around the x-axis, rotation around y, and rotation around z. What we're going to do is we're going to rotate the box 45 degrees around all of them. And we do that by specifying a sec, uh, an SEN vector 3. And we're just going to use that convenience constant we just defined. Degrees 45, degrees 45, degrees 45. What we want to do now is we want to give the box a shiny blue color. So we need to set both its diffuse and specular reflections. I'm going to do a tiny bit of copy pasta. I know I'm breaking all kinds of rules here, but I'm going to copy from sphere.geometry where we set the color and go down here below where we set the box's Euler angles, change sphere to box really quickly, and specify the color as UI color blue. Hooray for live coding. Now, what we also want to do is give it a white shine. So I'm going to copy, again, the box.geometry thing, the uh, box.geometry line I, we just entered. I'm going to copy it on the line below. Oops, there we go. And I'm going to change diffuse to specular. Once again, specular reflection is the shininess of an object. And I'm going to set that color to white. So it should be box.geometry. First material. Dot specular. Dot contents equals UI color. Dot white. 
And with that, we have fully defined the box, so it's time to add it to the scene. Once again, we access the canvas and its scene property, and from that scene property, its root node. And to its root node, we add a child node, and that child is box. At which point, we now have Hello World 2.0. Fire, uh, fire up the app. Box. Fear. Box. OK. And as I walk around the box, see, I'll try not to fall off the stage here. Actually, I need to walk over here because uh, the lighting, yeah, here it is. The lighting comes from the origin. So you should see some, let me position myself near the origin. You should see some shininess on the box. I need to find the angle from which, there we go. There's some shininess on the box right there. That is specular reflection. OK, next thing to do is animate that box. We're going to spin it around the y-axis. So let's go back to the code and back and draw test shapes. Go to, animate the, go to the animate the blue box content uh, comment. And we're going to define an action called rotate action. Those of you who have done any sprite kit programming, you should find this familiar. Rotate action will be an instance of SEN action. It is some kind of action that we can attach to an object in SceneKit. And this particular action will be rotate. Let's go with pick the wrong one here. Rotate. There's a whole bunch you can pick from. The one we're looking for is rotate by, as, uh, uh, where by is in the parameters. And what this lets us do is this lets us specify um, how much to rotate by, around what, uh, around what vector, and for how long. So in this case, what we want to do is we want this thing to rotate 360 degrees. Quickly, what's 360 degrees in radians? 2 times pi. You got it. There we go. So we'll do that. 2 times pi. No, not two times. Uh, two times dot pi. There we go. Now we need to specify what this thing needs to rotate around. It expects a vector. So we're going to define a vector that is parallel to the y axis. I'm going to type in SEN vector 3. And a vector that's parallel to the y axis is 0, 1, 0. So basically, that is a one meter high line just pointing straight up. That is, oh, that, that is parallel to the y-axis, which means you're going to be rotating this object around the y-axis. Then finally, we, want, we need to specify duration. That is how long it takes for the rotation to be performed. I'm going to say two seconds. All right. We want this thing to spin continuously, so we're going to define an, another action because actions can affect other actions. And we're going to call it rotate forever action. So let rotate forever action equal and it is also a kind of SEN action, so we will instantiate that. And, the, and it is a repeat forever action. And it takes an action as an argument to be repeated forever, and that, repeat forever, that action will be rotate action. So there we go. We have now created rotate forever action, at which point we want, the, we want it to happen to the box. So we go box dot run action. We tell it to run the action we just created, and that action is? Rotate forever action. All right. Run the app. I'm going to pick an origin. Happy blue sphere in front of us in just a moment. Yay. And above it, rotating box. We just made a 1980s made for TV sci fi movie. Okay. <laughs> All right. We now know how to paint static objects to, the, uh, to a 3D scene. We know how to paint dynamic objects to a 3D scene. It is now time to take advantage of the phone's position and angles, and let's go, uh, and let's go make a paint program. So we are going to get the device's location, orientation, and position. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to view did. We're going to go back to view did load, and we're going to go say goodbye to draw test shape. So remove that call to draw draw a test shape. We don't need it anymore. This was, that was just an exercise to help you get used to the idea of paint, adding objects to a 3D scene. What we want to do now is we want to go to the code section called ARSCN View Delegate Methods. 
terribly long name, and we are looking for a me method called renderer, will render scene at time. And it gets called every time an AR scene is about to be rendered in an, uh, under ideal conditions and on the fastest phone, the iPhone 10 at the moment, it will, uh, it will blast the, it will blast images of the AR scene 60 times a second. We need the device's location, orientation, and position, and we, to do that, we need the point of view property of the canvas, and we need to know that it is not nil, and we're at the beginning of a method, so does anybody know what kind of statement we're about to use? Guard, that's right. Swift's favorite code bouncer, the guard. So we're gonna use guard let point of view, and we're going to set it equal to the canvas's point of view, which, as you might have inferred, is the canvas's point of view. And if we can't get that value, we're going to return. So it'll be guard let point of view equal canvas point of view, else return. Immediately after the statement, we know that we have a point of view value. And from that, we are going to get that point of view's transform matrix. So we're gonna say let transform equal point of view dot transform. Once again, that's that, it's that four by four grid which defines the point of view's position and orientation and all kinds of other things in 3D space. And from that, we need to pull out three, uh, we need to pull out two sets of three numbers. The first thing we want to do is we want to get the orientation or the angles at which the device is being held. And we do that by pulling out a vector of 3D numbers. Here's where you have to type carefully. Inside the 3D matrix, we want the first, second, and third numbers of the third column of the transform matrix. I know that's a lot. Just follow along with me. It's going to be negative transform dot M31 negative transform dot m32. Once again, harness the power of autotype to help you type. And neg negative transform dot m3, anybody guess? Three? Here we go. Can anybody uh, notice that I've negated these numbers? Any, anybody care to hazard a guess as to why? Okay, um, the orientation I'm getting right now is the orientation of the screen, which faces this way. I need the orientation of the camera, which faces that way, basically the negative of the screen position. That's why I'm negating those numbers. The, getting the location of the device is rather similar. Once again, it is an SEN vector three, but this time I need the first, second, and third rows of the fourth column of the transform matrix. So it will be transform.m41, transform.m42, and transform.m4, anybody guess? Three, right, big prize there, right? We have these two vectors now. We're going to do a little vector addition because the complete position of the camera is simply the sum of the two. So. We're going, to, we're going to define a va variable called position, and position is going to be orientation plus location. And before you tell me that SEN vector does not have a built-in addition method, I defined one. It's at the bottom of the class. And finally, really quickly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw in a print statement because I want you to feel satisfied that uh, something uh, that we are doing uh, th that we are doing something here. Uh, and in that print statement, sorry, let me scroll it up so you can see things. I'm just going to say, do this. Print position equal, uh, print position colon backslash, you know, our favorite backslash parentheses position. If you were to run the app right now and go look at your debug console and just move your phone around, you should see a whole bunch of numbers changing. Let me uh, throw them up. Actually, I don't need to fire up. Uh, I don't need to throw the app on the screen, but uh, if, I, if I move my phone around, you should see these values change. So this is just to make you feel good that, yeah, something is actually happening, and we will do something a little more dramatic in the next step.
But I just want, yeah, I, I never want, to, want you to feel that, oh, you know, um, <laughs> I don't want you to have that, oh, yeah, the check is in the mail kind of feeling in this demo. I want you to always feel that something is happening, always. Okay, but let's get back to the code. We're going to go back again to renderer, will render scene at time. And what we want to do is we want to go down to just below the part that says dispatch queue.main.async. Uh, what we are doing in here is we are drawing something to the UI, so we want to guarantee we're doing it in the main thread, hence the dispatch queue.main.async. Uh, async block, and go under create the brush and erase any old cursor shapes. So this is going to call a method which is going to throw, uh, throw uh, the currently selected object that the user has picked onto the screen using the method that we learned to draw the sphere and the cube. So we're going to define a constant called brush, and we are going to call self.createBrush which is a method that's already in this class. It's something I've done for you already. And we are going to pass it the uh, parameters self.brushsettings.shape. This is an object that gets passed to us from the other tab so that we know which shape the user has picked. And the user has also picked the brush size, so we are going to set that second parameter to self dot brush settings dot size. And the position will be that position vector we just calculated. Fantastic. The other thing we're going to do is we are going to erase any nodes named cursor. So basically what we, uh, what we do is we're going to draw a shape in the middle of the screen, and if the user is holding down the paint button, we, we actually want it to leave a trail. If the user is not holding down the paint button, we don't want that object to leave a trail. We'll mark it as a cursor. But the idea is we want the user to have an idea of where they're going, uh, if they hold the paint button, where the shape is going to appear on the screen. So let's go down just inside if self.paint button is highlighted. This is true if and only if the user is holding down the paint button. And let's give the brush a color. So it's going to be brush dot geometry. Once again, we're going to be dealing with this long chain of uh, properties. Dot first material, dot diffuse, dot contents equals, and this time it's going to be self dot brush settings dot color. Once again, we are getting these properties which were set by the other tab. Uh, these are the user selection. We also want to give the brush a shine. And the easy way to do that is to copy that prior line, paste it just below, change diffuse to specular. So it's brush.geometry.firstmaterial.specular.contents equals white, uh, UI color dot white. We just want it to have a white shine. Don't worry, we're nearly there. What I want you to do now is see these, um, see this first line right here, brush.geometry.firstmaterial.diffuse.contents equals self.brushsettings.color. I can't believe I said that, but grab that and copy it. And let's go down, let's go down to here, this else statement. The user is not pre uh, yeah. The user is not pressing the paint button. Set the shape to the cursor color and name, and paste that line there. But this time, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of self dot brush settings dot color and change it to UI color. I should type in UI color dot light gray. So this is going to be when the user is not pressing the button. We just want to draw the shape as a cursor. And we're going to give the brush, we set the name property of brush to cursor so we know which ones to erase. So only the, pa only the shapes that the user has painted, uh, painted to the real world will remain. Cursor shapes will disappear 60 times a second. 
With all that, it is time to paint the shape to the screen, and thankfully, it is just one line. It is, we are accessing self's canvas, and we are setting its scene, we are accessing its scene property, and from that, we want its root node, and of course, we want to add the child node, and that child node is brush. At this point, we have a mostly functioning paint program. Run it. So this is the cursor. I hold down the paint button. And I can walk away and view my creation in 3D. And I can switch to the brush settings, maybe make the brush smaller, change it to ooh, purple torus. That's a toroid. For those of you who aren't into math, that's a donut. Ooh. You see, I can walk around and then walk away and notice, yeah, yeah, they have remained in space. And I can lie down and look, look at the pretty shapes I painted. And so can you. And uh, you can do things like draw horns over the people, you know, over the person behind you, or a mustache, or whatever. Try, uh, try it. Try it at lunch. Okay, we're going to do one more thing and then take a break, and that is we are going to we're going to make it possible to animate these shapes. So, go back. Let's go back to renderer. Renderer will render scene at time, and there is one more if clause here. And that is animate the shape it's, if it's supposed to be animated. What we're going to do is actually the simple way is to remember draw test shapes. We're not calling it anymore, but it's still there. Let's copy these two actions here. Let rotate action and let rotate forever action. Copy those and then scroll back down. Scroll back down to renderer, will render, will render at time, and go to where it says if self brush settings is spinning. So if the user has selected that, what we want to do is we want to have these two actions defined. So they're there, let rotate action equal SEN action, rotate by, rotate forever action. And this time, we'll have the brush run the action. So brush, run action, rotate forever action. And once again, run the app. And we now have a capability that Bob Ross would have loved to have had. So fire up the app, go to brush settings, and at the bottom, of the sc at the bottom there, there's a switch that's called, that says spin, spinning shapes. Set it to yes. And now paint the shapes. Congratulations. We finished Happy AR Painter Demo 1, and you have a psychedelic painting app that Bob Ross would be really proud to have. Uh, we're going to work on our next app, which is the Ray Wenderlich version of the IKEA app, and it's called Ray Kia, named after uh, our favorite Swedish semi-disposable furniture store. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ended friendships or relationships by inviting somebody to help you build IKEA furniture, but sometimes it is very enraging. <laughs> but what we're going to be taking revenge here now is, okay, in demo one, we were just using the camera's position and location in the real world to draw, to overlay shapes in the real world. Now what we're going to do is we're going to actually use some of these sensor smarts. Remember, phones, uh, iPhones and iPads are basically computers bundled with a lot of sensor devices, way more than a computer, uh, way more than your typical desktop computer. Let's put it this way. The toilets at the airport are more aware of your presence than most computers. Because they flush when you go away, right? Like that's, um, but uh, yeah, phones and iPads are more aware of your presence because they have all these sensors. We're going to use these sensors to perform plane detection. We're going to detect horizontal planes 
and we're going to, once we've detected them, we're going to go, okay, these are places where we can put things. And we are also going to detect vertical planes, and we are going to use them, and we're going to go, okay, we found a vertical plane. What are we going to do with it? We're going to put posters of Ray on, on, those, ver uh, on those detected real-world vertical planes. Little pro tip here, if it's your first time presenting at RW DevCon, flatter the organizer. <laughs> All right. Activating plane detection is really easy. We just make a couple of settings. We add a couple of settings to the AR world tracking con uh, uh, configuration. The first thing is we want to make sure that we are aligning uh, the coordinate system with gravity. And I will explain why in just a moment. But yes, you do need to align the plane. Uh, pl you need to align the coordinate system to gravity for this thing to work. And the other thing we do is we're going to specify what kind of planes we want to detect. In this particular case, we want to detect both horizontal and vertical planes. So we are going to set the AR World configuration's plane detection property to both horizon dot horizontal and dot vertical. There's a thing called AR anchors, and we're going to get used to them. They are basically bookmarks that denote a position and orientation in real-world space. And there's two ways that they can get added to an AR scene. You can do it yourself programmatically and go, look, I want to remember this particular space and this particular orientation in the real world. But the other way is that ARKit will also do that automatically whenever it detects the things you want it to detect. In this particular case, we're telling ARKit, hey, detect, uh, detect horizontal and vers vertical planes and, that, uh, and stick an AR anchor there so I know where they are so I can do something with them. So that's what we're going to be doing. And ARKit detects horizontal planes. Do we have any math geniuses in the room? Or anybody who took some math. Uh, does, anybody <laughs> does anybody know what you need to find a plane or what you need to make a, the equation for a plane? Three points. Three points? OK, that's one way. But uh, do you know the way with one point? Point and a line. That is right. And that point, OK. And you are correct. It is a point and a normal vector to the plane. And then based on that, you can get, you can define the plane and if you remember, or if you avoided math, it's AX plus BY plus uh, CZ equals zero. But anyways, given a point on the plane, which the iPhone, iPhone or iPad can detect with its camera, and a normal vector to the plane, you can detect a horizontal plane easily. Does anybody know where we get that normal vector from? It's gravity. And in fact, uh, you get psychedelic effects if you try to detect horizontal planes with, uh, the, uh, but do not align the wor world alignment coordinate system to gravity. Uh, you see, uh, I did it, and you would see planes spinning off into the distance in a psychedelic fashion. It's kind of neat. But because gravity is everywhere and we can rely on it, uh, uh, ARKit is fantastic at detecting horizontal planes. Vertical planes, tougher. You can still find the point. The camera can do that really easily. It's finding the normal to a vertical plane. And somebody asked me, hey, why not just make a vector perpendicular to gravity? Does anybody know why that doesn't work? That's because there's 360 degrees of vectors that are perpendicular to gravity. So that's why. And special bragging rights to somebody who even came close to guessing that. So ARKit has to use visual trickery to detect vertical planes. So the first thing it tries to do is it tries to detect something that, oh, maybe this is rectangular. It's got high, it's got high contrast borders. Because once again, you know, it's got a really good camera, and it can do that. And if it sees something kind of rectangular, even off at an angle, uh, it knows, hey, that must be a vertical plane. Let's mark it as such. The other way is to take a known horizontal plane and then move a little up and start tracing feature points down towards the horizontal plane. And if they're about the same distance, it goes, that's probably a wall, and therefore a vertical plane. And then finally, there's this trick that it uses called ray casting. Once again, it's all about finding a horizontal plane, which it's very good at, and then tracing an imaginary line along the edge of that horizontal plane off into the distance. And based on that, it goes, OK, I can trace that line. Let me draw a bunch of lines that go off into the distance 
that are parallel to that line. Cool. And now let's find some rectangular things that intersect those lines that I've drawn off into the distance. That's probably a vertical surface. So a lot of, a lot of computational magic behind the scenes to indirectly calculate where a vertical surface is. That is why it didn't appear until ARKit 1.5 and did not appear in the original ARKit. OK. Now, we need to perform something as well in our IKEA app or our Reikia app called hit testing. And that is, it, it basically just answers the question, OK, if the user taps on something on my, the 2D screen, did that, does that uh, co uh, correspond to a real world object in the 3D world? And what we do is hit testing is simply extending an imaginary line out from where the user tapped on the screen and trying to see if that imaginary line intersects any real world or virtual objects in the 3D scene. And the hit test method returns an array of objects from closest to farthest, where closest is the first object in the array and farthest is the last object in the array. And right now we're only concerned about what uh, the closest object of the, in the hit test is. That, that is what we believe the user tapped on, and we're going to use that. I'm going to go really quickly over this one. Uh, the, uh, I have some methods already built in. We're not going to be coding this up, but I want you to know what causes real-world tracking to fail. And there are things like too few features. The camera cannot, uh, cannot get enough landmarks to get a, a good sense of what's in the room. Too much motion. Once again, because of that, the camera can't get a good sense of the room. Too little light also messes with tracking. And also, just relocating. Perhaps you're running an AR session, you answer the phone, you walk a mile away, and you start up the AR, uh, and then you return to the app. And of course, the app is going to have no idea where you are. The place you're in has completely different features in ge geometry. And you can find out how well the camera is tracking by checking, uh, by checking this delegate method, session did camera did change tracking state, which sets this property, arcamera.tracking state, and it will have one of these possible values. Not available, so for some reason, AR, AR kit does not work on the device. Normal, which means AR kit will work, is functioning just fine. And then limited. So something is messing with ARKit's ability to track the real world. And usually the causes are it's the system's initializing, the user is moving around too quickly, and we can detect that. And we can also send the user messages in the status box going, hey, slow down. Put down the coffee, cowboy. Uh, insufficient features. Uh, sometimes the room is too plain. More often than not, somebody's just covering up the camera with their and then finally, relocalizing. In other words, ARKit has determined, wow, you are in a completely different place. I need to reinitialize so I can get a better sense of what room or place you're in right now. And with that, we can start coding. So open up demo two, starter project. I'm going to switch to Xcode and do the same demo two, starter, reikia.xcodeproj. Once again, I'm going to give you a quick tour of the main storyboard. Ooh, it's another custom tab bar controller type app. Once again, user selections uh, already coded up for you in the second tab. We are dealing with the view controller for the first tab. And that is room view controller dot swift. Once again, we are going to do all our work in this for convenience sake. Uh, I know that whoever was running the architecture class will be screaming at me because I did everything in the view controller. But for the purposes of a demo, that's OK. So what we want to do is we want to set up the AR configuration first. So under a section called the initializer section, go to create AR configuration. And we're going to add some code between let config and return config. So the first thing we want to do is set the world, the world alignment. And we have two options, basically. Uh, we have a couple of options. Either gravity or gravity and heading will do. I'm going to pick gravity. 
either will do. Basically, what we want to do is we want to say, look, we need to be able to uh, set up and down based on gravity because that's how horizontal plane detection works. We then want to say, OK, look, we want to enable plane detection. So we're going to set the config's plane detection property to an array containing dot horizontal and dot vertical. At this point, ARKit knows, OK, I need to detect those planes. And every time I do, I need to add an AR, we, I need to add an AR anchor to that scene and then notify, notify the delegate. And that will happen momentarily. We're also going to turn on is light, uh, light estimation. And that's done by setting configs it is light to, uh, estimation enabled property to true. What this does is this uses the camera to detect how much light there is in the scene. And that is going to determine how bright or how dark the virtual objects are in the scene. So in other words, they're going to actually match the lighting in the room a little better. So I mean, the last thing you want is when we're adding objects to a dark room, they are bright as all get out. They look, more, they, they look artificial. By setting this true, the objects we draw on the scene appear more natural. And then finally, I'm adding the. Oh, Let's put it on the right line. I'm adding this. We're not using it, but I'm adding it here because I want you to know that it exists. And it is a property called provides audio data. We're going to set it to false. But I want you to know it exists because what you can do is you can add sound nodes to a 3D scene. And as you get closer to them, they get louder. And as you move away, they get, uh, as you move away, they get quieter. We're not using it in this app, but I want you to know they exist because that, uh, that could create some really neat AR kit experiences. Uh, and I just want you to know that, yeah, you can do that, but we're not covering it. You're going to have to experiment on your own. So now it's time to uh, implement a method that's going to draw planes over any detected surfaces. So we're going to go to the plane detection section. I've divided the app into a bunch of sections. So under plane detection, there is a method called draw plane node on four. And it accepts it accept a node and an AR number, and we're going to do something with those. The first thing we need to do is go just under this comment, create a plane node with the same position and size as the detected plane. And yeah, that's what we're going to do, create a plane node with the same size as the plane that uh, Th th that AR kit detected. So we're going to define a constant called let using let plane node. And it is an instance of a scene kit node, SCN node. And we're going to pick the constructor that accepts a geometry. That geometry is going to be an SCN plane. And we need to pick that constructor. And that particular constructor is going to be the one that accepts a width and height. And here's where I'm going to do a little bit of formatting so this is easier to follow. So I'm going to do it like this. And we're going to take the width, uh, we're going to take the width based on the anchor that we can provide it. Remember, the, uh, uh, anchor, an AR anchor gives us all kinds of geometric information. So we're going to take the plane anchor and its extent. That defines the size of the plane. Oops, here we go. Extent x. And that's going to be the, uh, the width of the plane. And then for the uh, height of the plane, which is actually its depth, we're going to take its z extent. And if you're typing along, you're probably seeing that Xcode is complaining. And that's because it wants these as CG float values. So let's cast them as CG float values. So in the end, you should have something that looks like this. CG float. We, uh, once we've defined the plane's size, we need to give it a location. So we're going to set its position. Oops, that was not it. Oh, no, plain node position, not plain anchor position. My, my mistake. And it's a position, so it's an instance of SEN vector 3. 
and we're just going to use the plane anchor's coordinates. In fact, the, plane, the, the center of the plane anchor. So it'll be plane anchor dot center dot x, comma, plane anchor dot center dot y, and plane anchor dot center dot z. And just to be on the safe side, what we're going to do is we're going to paint both sides of the plane. So we're going to say, we're going to specify that its geometry dot first material is double sided equals true. This is more of a safety precaution than anything. We just want to make sure that no matter what angle the user looks at the plane, they're going to see, uh, they're going to see it's going to look like something. Now here's the interesting thing about plane, uh, about drawing planes, adding planes to a scene relative to a plane anchor. It turns out, can you still hear me? There we go. It, it, it turns out that scene kit likes, likes to draw planes like this when we want a plane drawn like this. So we need to rotate it, uh, we need to rotate it 90 degrees clockwise around the x-axis. So we'll do that. Right here, in the, under the comment, align the plane, no, plane with the anchor. We're just going to say plane node dot Euler angles. So to rotate it 90 degrees only around the x-axis, it's an SEN vector 3, negative double dot pi, not double oi, double pi divided by 2, comma 0, comma 0. So basically we're saying only rot rotate it 90 degrees around the x-axis. All right, so we've created the plane, but what we haven't done is we haven't painted it yet. And we're going to paint two different things depending on whether the plane's horizontal or vertical. If the plane is horizontal, we're going to go, OK, that's a floor. We can put furniture on it. So we're going to paint a grid image over it. If, the, if it's vertical, we're going to say, ah, vertical surface. It's a wall. Let's throw up a poster of Ray. So we'll do that. So we're going to create an if statement, if plane anchor dot alignment. And this is where we determine if it's horizontal or vertical. So if statement and create an else, so we'll handle both cases. So the, if plane anchor dot alignment equals dot horizontal, what we're going to do is we're going to paint it, we're going to paint it with the picture of a grid. I've already defined the grid picture in, image, uh, in, uh, in the assets fo folder, so it will be plane node dot geometry, this should be familiar to you at this point, dot first material, dot diffuse, dot contents equals, but this time we're going to go with a UI image and not a UI color, and that UI image, oh, dope. UI image, and that UI image will be a named one, and that name is grid, lowercase g-r-i-d. It'll be a grid that'll appear on the floor that says uh, insert, uh, place furniture here. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to set that plane node's name, just, uh, pro name property to horizontal. Once again, time for some copy pasta. We're, let's copy that clause, stick it under else. And this is the case where the plane is vertical, so we want it to, we want it to have a UI image named Ray instead and we want its name to be vertical. And finally, we want to add that plane node we just created to the scene. So we do that, we've been passed a node that we can add, attach the plane node to as a child. So we're going to take that node and add a child node, and that child node is plane node. And that will add it to the scene. Finally, 
Uh, I've got, a, I've got an instance variable that defines the app state. If we've detected something, I just want to say that the room is ready to furnish. So I'm going to uh, set app state to, and there's a predefined enum. You can look it up in the code. This isn't going to affect your understanding of ARKit at all. I'm just going to set it to ready to furnish. All right. And with that, we have defined a method that draws the appropriate plane depending on the detected surface. We need to do one more thing before we can take our first run of the app, and that is to handle newly detected surfaces. So what we want to do is we're looking for, under plane detection again, the plane detection section, we are looking for renderer did add for. It's that method, I believe it's at the top of the section mark, plane detection. Renderer did add for gets called whenever ARKit goes, ah, I've detected, a, I've detected something. I'm going to add an AR anchor to it. And the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that that AR anchor corresponds to a plane. And the way we do that is we're going to use a guard let statement. So it'll be guard let plane anchor equals the anchor we were just passed. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and cast it as an AR plane anchor. And if it does get cast as a plane anchor, we know it is a plane anchor, and we can work with it. Otherwise, return. So immediately after this line, immediately after this line, we know we're dealing with a plane anchor, because the guard statement has ensured that. Once we've done that, we can actually draw that, the plane over the detected surface. So we're going to call draw plane node. Remember, that's the thing we just defined on node for plane anchor. All right. And guess what? We're at a point where we can run the app, and things will actually happen. So let's do that. Oh, why did it fail? Ah, team. I forgot to set my team. Team. Now let's run it. Oh, and let me throw, throw what I've got up on the big screen. Oh, still running the old app. Come on, compiling. There we go. And let's look around for some floor. I'm going to look around here. See what, see that? Place furniture here. So there's a grid that has appeared. Let me look for some vertical surfaces. Sometimes the monitor makes a good vertical surface to detect. Oh, there we go. It spotted vertical surface, and it's gone, OK, ha, ah, vertical surface detected. Let's draw a ray. So that's what that, if statement, that's what that if statement does. If it was a horizontal, draw the grid. If it's vertical, draw a ray. All right, let's get back to the app. So back to view, view controller dot Swift. Make sure you're somewhere here in the code. So basically, once again, renderer, renderer did add for. What I want you to do is I want you to copy and paste that guard let plane anchor equals anchor as AR plane anchor line. We're going to use it a couple of times. So. I want you to scroll down to this, line, uh, to this particular method here. Renderer did update node for anchor. All right? This is what, uh, this is what happens when AR, this gets called whenever ARKit revises its estimate of what planes are in the room. It's going, oh, you know what? It's larger than I thought. I'm going to revise my estimate. We need to make sure, once again, we're only dealing with a plane anchor. So take that line and paste it there. Oops. I copied the wrong thing. Let's try that again. I want that guard let plane anchor equals copy that and paste that line under once again we only want to deal with plane anchors. I'm just trying to save you some typing. Sc scroll down a little further. Pass draw plane node to this method. 
renderer did remove node for anchor. Once again, we only want to deal with plain anchors, so paste that line there again. Once again, for all these methods, we're just making sure that when we've, de when we've detected something, we only want to deal with planes. Then scroll back up. Scroll back up to renderer did update. OK, basically what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, look, if we've already drawn a grid over a detected plane, or, uh, or we've drawn a poster array over a detected vertical plane, and ARKit has revised this estimation, we're going to get rid of what we drew and then base our, the new that we're going to draw something new using the new estimated dimensions and positions. So the first thing we need to do is remove any nodes that we have drawn over that old detected plane. And the way to do that is by enumerating over that node's child nodes, which will let us, which will let us basically pick out those nodes and remove them. So we're going to go node enumeration, enumerate child nodes, and we're going to use a uh, we're going to use a closure to get rid of them really quickly. So it'll be like this: child node comma in child node comma underscore in. Basically, we're, what we're saying is we're looping through. We're getting two values every time we go through each child node. We only care about the first one, and that is child node. So child node, and we want to remove it from the parent node. So we call the remove from parent node method. Once you've typed that in, copy it. Because we're going to use that exact same. Uh, we're going to use that exact, this exact same line, and we might as well not have to type down. If you scroll back down to renderer did remove node for anchor. There's a line there that says remove any children this node may have. That is the exact same code. Paste that line there. And finally, we need to scroll back up to that up did update method. So scroll back up to renderer did update node, did update for. And we need to make one call right underneath update the plane over this surface. So basically, we have just gotten. Um, We've just erased a plane we drew, and we need to redraw it using the new dimensions. So we're going to do that. We're going to call draw plane node on node for plane anchor. And we're going to run the app again. This time, as I move the camera around, am I on the big screen? Yeah. As I move the camera around, ARKit gets a better sense of the room, and it starts expanding the place furniture here grid, which is exactly what we want. And in fact, if I do it over the big, yeah, if I do it over this big space here, yeah, it expands the grid really quickly. ARKit's going, wow, this room's a lot bigger than I initially thought. Makes the revisions, and then we make our revisions of the grid based on ARKit's revisions. Same deal with vertical surfaces. I start move. Ray's picture gets bigger. I, yeah, it got a little bigger as AR kit gets a better estimation of the vertical surfaces. Oh, he's getting huge. <laughs> OK. We can, uh, I actually set up the demo so we can skip step six and jump straight to step seven, which is handling taps on the screen. So uh, if we go back to the code and go to a s the section, it's near the bottom. It's called adding and removing furniture. Go there. And what we're going to do is we're looking for a method called handle screen tap. And in handle screen tap, we're going to find the first thing we want to do is find where the user tapped on the screen. That's pretty straightforward. And that we do by defining a 
uh, defining a constant called tap scene view, because we want to know what it is that the user tapped first. And that is equal to sender.view as we want to cast it as an AR scene view, AR SCN view. Now that, we now that we have the thing that the user tapped, we can get its, that tap location. So we're going to define a constant called let tap location. And it will be sender dot location in tap scene view. So now we know where on the screen the user tapped. It is time to create a hit test. And a hit test, once again, expects two things, where the user tapped on the scene, and then as the iPhone extends a line out into space, what are we looking for intersections with that line? So we're going to create something called plane intersections. And that is going to be equal to tap scene view dot hit test. So we're going to call the hit test method for the AR scene view. And it expects two arguments. The first one is where the user tapped on the screen. That is tap location. Now we need to specify the kind of things we want to detect that the user tapped on. And in this case, we want something called existing planes using geometry. In other words, I want to know where, uh, if the user tapped on planes for which we know the size of. What happens is the hit test will fill the array plane intersections with a bunch of object uh, with a bunch of objects that you get from extending an imaginary line from the phone out into the real world and going, okay, does this line intersect any planes that we're aware of? And if the closest of those planes is horizontal, we're going to drop the current furniture item on it. So let's do that. Uh, we're going to go if not plane intersections dot is empty. So in other words, if there's something inside that array, let's get the first thing. So we're going to create a constant called first hit test result. And it's simply just plane intersections dot first. And we're sure that we're dealing with the first, so we can use an exclamation mark and force it. And based on that, we want to make sure we're only dealing with a plane anchor, so we're going to use the old trick, guard, let, plane anchor equal first hit test result dot anchor. So we want the anchor for the first hit test result. We want to make sure that it is a plane anchor, so we try to cast it as an AR plane anchor, else return. Once again, what this means is that once we're past this line, we know we're dealing with a plane. We need to do one more thing, and that is check if that plane is horizontal. So if plane anchor dot alignment equals dot dot horizontal, add furniture for, to given the coordinate first hit test result. We only have six more lines of code, and then we have a functioning app. That is the good news. And those six lines of code live in the next method down, add furniture. We need to do just two things. Get the real world posi position corresponding to where the user tapped on the screen. And then, of course, get the furniture item and drop it in the right place. So for getting the real world p position, what we need to do is we need to get the transform matrix. So we're going to create a uh, constant called transform. We need to get the transform matrix of that hit test result. And once again, the transform matrix is this 4 by 4 grid of numbers that specifies position, orientation, and all kinds of things about an object. In this case, it's the first, the first plane that we have detected that the user has tapped on. So we want the hit test result. We want the world transform of the hit test result. That describes its position and orientation relative to the origin. From that, we need to get its position, 
which we can. So let's create a uh, variable called position. And we're going to use a little shortcut here. All we need to do is get the third column, actually, no, the fourth column of that, uh, particular, of that particular matrix. And we do that by this, let position equal transform dot columns dot three. This method was written by a different API team than, the, uh, um, uh, than another API team where we said that the third column is number three. Th this team decided that the first, uh, the first column would be column zero. So this is what happens when API teams don't talk to each other. But this gives us the position of, uh, this gives us the, position of, the uh, of the anchor that we just detected. And from that, we're going to calculate an initial position for the furniture. And that's basically the x, y, and z values of that transform column. So it's SEN vector 3. You know, let's change. That's supposed to be position column there. SEN3, vector3, position column dot x, position column dot y, and position column dot z. Three more lines, and we are done. So we now have the initial position where we're supposed to drop the furniture because we've gotten it from we've gotten it from where the user tapped on the screen and where it corresponds to the real world floor. So we need to create a node now, and that node will be that node will be the currently selected furniture, which is provided to us in the furniture settings uh, object, and it gives us a, there's a method called current furniture piece that gives us a 3D object that we're going to draw. Because not all my uh, 3D models have, uh, uh, have the same origin, I define some offsets. So just take it on faith for this one. Basically, I'm taking the initial, uh, initial position that we calculated, and I'm adding, I'm adding something that I'm getting from the furniture object that just tells me how much the uh, origin of the furniture is offset by. This just makes sure that one of the objects, the chair, I just don't want it to be sunk in the middle of the floor, whereas all, everything else lines up very nicely with the floor. There's one more line, and that's just to add the furniture to the scene. So it's scene view dot scene dot root node dot add child node, and that child is, in this case, node. So type that, and guess what? We have a functioning, we have a functioning Ray Kia app. Let's take it out for a spin. So I'm running it. I'm going to throw it on the big screen again. Oop. Let's try that. Looking for place furniture here. Okay, good. I'm going to I'm going to move around, expand it a little more. I'm going to tap on the grid now. Boom! Bookshelf. And then. Uh, here I've got, uh, I've got made up IKEA furniture, because IKEA furniture all needs silly names. So chair is butt plays. The couch is called derp. And the table is called tebble. So yeah, uh, I'm going to pick, I'm going to tap on tebble. Oops. Find a place to put it. Tap on the grid, table. Uh, oh, I want a derp couch. Derp. And there you go. And guess what? You have just written IKEA's app. So go to your local furniture company, sell them to this for thousands of dollars, and get rich. And then buy Ray and Vicky a present. Well, guess what? Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, you know what? I want to do one more thing really, really quickly. Actually, I need to go to the present. Uh, I'll make this quick. It's just the end of the presentation. Oops, let's get past this. It's just the conclusion. There's just a couple of things that I want to point out real quickly. First of all, yeah, you learned how, you learned how to make two apps, but there's a lot you didn't learn because it's a big area to cover. Uh, embedding video, 2D image recognition, scene kit physics, sprite, and a, sprite kit and AR kit and AR kit and core location, but you can go to a couple of places. The mothership, 
Apple has a whole bunch of stuff, but what's even more useful is the awesome ARKit repo on GitHub, which links to all a whole bunch of open source kits. Definitely check it out. And yes, there is an AR kit by Tutorials book coming out soon. I've taken great pain to make sure that these demos do not overlap with the book. So you buy the book, you're going to get totally different things. You have not been robbed. And yes, there will be articles and videos coming soon. These are the early days, so uh, get ready for lots of changes. But there's one more thing I want to bring up really quickly, and that is you have a responsibility. And that, uh, that's because AR kit, with AR kit, you are literally you are literally attaching editorial to what people see. Please do not make the world black mirror. Do not write apps that slander neighborhoods or slander people or do things like, oh, oh a competitor. You know what? I'm going to block your view of that. Or don't use ARKit to spread fake news, please. You know what? You have a responsibility uh, in the light of what's been happening with Facebook. Now you have to, it's not just enough to know how to program something, but please do the right thing. Don't make the world black mirror. It's a good TV show. It is terrible as real life. And yeah, there's lots of ways to find me online. I'm also here to answer questions, and I'm the easiest guy to find at the conference. I'm the one with the accordion. Thank you so much. Enjoy lunch.